Hello young and old, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to look at this lovely Eberhardt & Co with a 7751 movement. So buckle up. Eberhardt is one of those uh, manufacturers that are a little bit uh, anonymous to a lot of people. But they produce some beautiful watches and they are especially known for uh, chronographs. This one has a 7751 movement, so a derivative of the 7750. Easily the most used chronograph movement ever. And we see that uh, it doesn't actually run. We can set the time, and you might have already seen that the weekday quick set pusher at uh, 10 o'clock works. Let's see at midnight. Yeah, so the weekday and date and GMT function work as they should. And the date quick set also works as it should. But it doesn't run. The 7750 family has a hack, so when you pull the crown out all the way to uh, time setting mode, then uh, you do stop the watch. But that's not the case here. I see the chronograph doesn't run either. So something is wrong in the Kingdom of Denmark. So open sesame, let's see what you're hiding. This watch has a screw down case back, as is uh, fairly common nowadays. It's a good way to uh, secure the case back. It means you do not damage any gaskets. There's also much less chance of scratching the case back a lot which commonly happens with the screw-on case packs. When people are curious what's inside and try to use whatever they have to open and then it slips and scratches. And there we have it. A very ubiquitous 7750 family. Honestly not a beautiful uh, movement, but very functional. And we see that for some reason the watch started running. So let's put it on the time grapher and see what we can see. And it looks pretty good to be honest. Yes, high beat there and the watch is running way too fast, but uh, the lines are straight. That's what we want. We'll check the play on the rotor. This is a ball bearing rotor. There's a special little thing with this screw for the rotor. It has this little dimple in the center. And that's to accommodate the chronograph seconds hand. Very important to use that screw there. It's a bit odd that the watch started running when we took the case back off. Doesn't seem to be anything pressing on the movement. We'll take the hands off. As much as we can, we want to use big hand levers. Small ones will be sharper. And they more easily slip as well. There are a few tiny marks on the dial around the hands. And that goes especially for the sub-dial hands. Now, there are no dial screws on this uh, movement. It's a typical ETA movement in that sense uses this uh, dial clamps, dial fasteners, which have their uh, benefits and their disadvantages. 
Now, when working on the 7750, it is actually quite uh, important that you have support in the movement holder. So if you do this uh, a few times, it's uh, well worth having a specific movement holder for the movement family. As you can see, I put in a generic crown and stem, actually because the original crown and stem for this uh, watch is uh, too short for the movement holder. Now there's a lot of uh, parts in this watch that want to jump out, literally. There are a lot of jumpers and springs everywhere. So for instance under those discs we took off for the weekday and the month. That's why we keep an eye out for that. Now speaking of the 7750 family, so the chronograph part is uh, identical. All the differences are on the dial side so they're all calendar related uh, differences so if you worked on a 7750 you probably know it has a standard date disc this triple calendar version as we saw has a hand for the date and two discs for the weekday and the month and it's also got a moon face and for some reason, Eberhardt uh, took the Moonface disc out. You can see that all the other components are actually still there, including the jumpers and the quick set. But no Moonface disc, and of course, no cutout in the dial either. So, we disassembled the calendar part, so we can take off this uh, calendar plate as well. Underneath that plate we have the 24 hour wheel and then we have the weekday sitting wheel and the hour and minute wheel. The hour hammer and the brake and the hour counting wheel. Now this is the actual cannon pinion, it's called a driving cannon pinion. And this construction is also why the hands move so, uh, let's say, slowly or little by every turn of the crown. There's a lot of gearing taking place. Now we're over on the chronograph side of the watch. We just started the chronograph. Just want to check that everything uh, runs as it should. The chronograph wheel in the center here, showing the seconds, has a little finger on it. And that little finger then moves the intermediate uh, minute counter wheel one tooth ahead per minute. So with uh, each revolution of the chronograph wheel, so just inspecting to see that that uh, goes as it should. And yeah, that looks uh, all right. And of course that uh, intermediate uh, minute counter wheel then that pushes the uh, minute counter wheel one tooth ahead also. Now anything more than showing the time on the watch is uh, termed a complication. So even a date is a complication. Of course the chronograph is a slightly more complicated complication. And it's also one of the most popular ones. It takes a little bit more space to uh, make a chronograph. So uh, chronograph watches are typically bigger. And Eberhardt actually had the 42 millimeter chronographs back in the 1940s. So they were sort of a little bit ahead in that sense. 
and there are a lot of beautiful uh, chronograph movements and in my opinion 7750 is not one of them there's a lot of floating pieces as you might see as we pick things apart here and it's uh, very much born out of uh, focus on uh, streamlining costs uh, making easy to manufacture parts much more than creating something that was beautiful nowadays uh, the 7750 is an ETA movement it was developed by a Valjou so you often hear Valjou 7750 and uh, Valjou was uh, one of the three main manufacturers of uh, chronographs in Switzerland Get with the Venus, who they actually acquired, and uh, Landron or Landron, especially Landron was known for their uh, column wheel chronographs. This one is a cam shifted chronograph, that's the cam that we're taking off there. Cams are much easier to manufacture than uh, column wheels, and uh, the 7750 was uh, made with this specifically in mind and really was a child of the quartz crisis so compared to its uh, predecessor the 7733 which was basically a little bit less refined uh, version of the venus 188 the 7750 is of course automatic it has a higher uh, beat rate and perhaps most crucially it has an oscillating pinion instead of the uh, traditional uh, horizontal clutch as uh, most um, chronographs before this one had and i think it's uh, quite uh, equivocal that uh, the horizontal clutch is the most beautiful uh, solution but it has its drawbacks as well and nowadays uh, quite a few chronographs also have uh, vertical clutches we will be looking at some other chronographs uh, very soon so we can have a look at the different uh, types as well and back in 1973 when uh, the 7750 was introduced it wasn't really celebrated it was really seen as more of a low cost less refined uh, version of course nowadays it's very ubiquitous if you walk into a watch store or if you browse chrono 24 you can bet your uh, something that uh, most of the chronographs will be 7750 driven And that also has a lot of benefits, of course, for people working with watches, like us, uh, a lot of uh, people on this channel. It means that there are a lot of spare parts. It means that you will uh, get used to uh, the movement. You will uh, know a little bit more about the quirks, the things to watch out for and so forth. Of course, nowadays ETA doesn't sell spare parts anymore, but the uh, Salita SW500 is basically the same movement, and Salita has now actually overtaken ETA in uh, movement production anyway. All right, well, we've been talking a lot. We've managed to strip the watch down. Last thing we need to do is uh, take off the shock setting in the balance. The shock settings on the balance and on the underside are different. The one in the balance is a little bit wider. And we're also going to take out the mainspring. 
given uh, the high uh, beat rate that we saw, we think it's probably perfect. And it looks good indeed. Just need to clean the barrel a little bit, and then we can head off to the cleaning machine. And 33 minutes later, we'll get a shiny new watch. Or about 150 pieces of one that we have to glue together with super glue and uh, duct tape. But we're up for the challenge. Let's start with uh, getting the mainspring back into the barrel. It's a very long mainspring. What you might have noticed is that uh, the lid of the barrel has a little pinion. If you can guess what that is, then uh, comment below. We're going to put some uh, cleaver on the barrel wall. Sort of goes nicely, this uh, sticky black thing with those uh, super villain uh, finger cuts from uh, Bergeon. I think those uh, black super villain uh, finger cuts also sort of contribute to the whole image of the watchmaker. I mean, it's like nowadays all the kids want to become watchmakers, right? It's like my uh, eight year old son, he wants to be a watchmaker. And I told him, no, 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 no. Get a, like a good job, like a influencer or YouTuber. And now that he knows that his dad is both a YouTuber and a watchmaker, he's like, whoa! That fascination will probably last maybe two weeks. Anyway, I'm gonna put some 9010 on the capsules. As noted uh, before, when there's a thicker jewel, it should go on the top, on the balance. And the same thing when it's a bigger jewel, it's typically also on the balance side. As is the case here. And then we we'll see the balance all slit nicely. With the higher bit movements like this one, we can easily turn the balance cock. So that's a benefit. The hair spring is much stiffer. For some reason, this is the 17 joule version. Typically, you would find the 25 joule versions. This is a 17 joule version, which means that there are, let's say, a few missing joules. 
nothing to call Interpol about, but uh, it is a bit uncommon to find that uh, some of the wheels in the wheel train, for instance, are not jeweled. You might ask, uh, what's the reason for having 17 jewel versions? And the main answer is uh, archaic customs rules. For instance, the US and also other customs, they separate between the watches with uh, 17 or fewer jewels and more than 17. And of course, uh, in today's uh, production, one jewel is probably worth, I don't know, five cents so it makes no sense whatsoever not that we would really think uh, customs is based on uh, common sense anyway but uh, there you go and of course uh, jewels in the movement uh, will uh, reduce friction reduce wear improve accuracy etc so most likely this watch was uh, produced for uh, export to the US. Alright, we got into the Achilles works. And you might remember this uh, watch has a hack. And the hack has a little uh, lever that uh, fits into the groove on the sliding pinion. So we have to make sure the sliding pinion is uh, positioned properly. Otherwise, the Achilles works is uh, pretty uh, undramatic. And that sort of sums up the overall movement as well, I would say. It's very much uh, function over form. Much more in line with uh, psycho philosophy than uh, Swiss, typically. I think if the uh, El Primero and the 7750 entered a beauty contest, then the El Primero would be the unanimous winner. And the 7750 would be the ugly stepbrother of the janitor uh, cleaning the puke off the floor after the El Primero's uh, victory party. And if you think that's an unfair uh, analogy, yes, absolutely. It isn't a beauty contest. And success lies in numbers. The 7750 is uh, easily the most successful chronograph movement ever. So as mentioned before, it makes it a very important movement to, uh, to know for us uh, watchmakers. We will come across it a lot and uh, it is a movement that is okay to work on. We're almost done with Achilles works. We oiled and greased the various parts. The setting lever spring and cover plate is uh, best assembled together with this intermediate setting wheel and then simply placed on top like this and as we do we screw the screws holding it down just a little bit and then we can put the setting lever spring onto that little nub on the setting lever Speaking of the oils and greases, one of the good things about, uh, let's say, a modern movement like this, even though it is actually almost 50 years old, is that uh, you can still find uh, the technical communication or the tech guides, if you will, that uh, show what you should do when you uh, take it apart and uh, reassemble. And part of that is, of course, also a lubrication chart. I'll post a link to the technical communication below. But uh, for the lubrication, the tech guide used to say that you should use Molecule DX for the grease. But uh, given that uh, Swatch bought out uh, Möbius uh, a few years back, it now recommends that you use uh, Möbius 9504, which is very similar, to be honest, to Molecule DX. 
but I think that's much more a commercial uh, recommendation than an actual uh, benefit-based one. Unless you think of the financial benefits to Swatch Group, which is what they do. So we put on the ratchet wheel, the crown wheel. We uh, fix or dropped the uh, pallet fork. And for those of you with sharp eyes, yes, it's the wrong screw in the ratchet wheel. I'll uh, replace that later. The ratchet wheel in the 7750 has this uncommonly small screw for the barrel arbor. That's my excuse anyway. So with the heart beating we can uh, wind the watch a bit and then we're gonna see if we can make it run a little bit nicer. So we see that it runs very fast and there's a big beat error. So the first thing we're gonna do is take out the beat error. And on uh, modern movements that's uh, quite easy. You just uh, move this uh, stud holder a little bit you probably have to do that in several iterations, back and forth a little bit. And of course we have to be very careful, we don't uh, mash the screwdriver into the balance. Tiny little adjustments. Itsy bitsy teeny weeny adjustments. Polka dot bikini. And I'm getting too old for this. I'm just getting the right edge for this, but anyway. So with those adjustments, we see that uh, the beat there can be uh, taken out. And for adjusting uh, the beat rate, how fast the watch uh, runs, we adjust the index. The index spans the hairspring. It shouldn't hold the hairspring tight, but the hairspring should just be allowed to breathe in between uh, two pins or similar. And it in essence means that the hairspring is made shorter or longer if we move the index. A shorter spring is uh, stiffer and thus uh, oscillates faster and vice versa for the longer spring. So that's how we make the watch uh, run faster or slower. You might have seen that the amplitude was not uh, that high. The watch wasn't fully wound, so that's the reason. Fully wound is around 300, so that's fine. We started assembling uh, parts of the automatic works and we're going to put on the, the cam. Put a little bit of D5 on the post and also at the underside of the cam. You might remember I had a thick layer of uh, grease, probably Molecote X, when we took it off. with the cam jumper in place and with the proper uh, ratchet wheel screw you can put on the chronograph bridge if the chronograph bridge doesn't seem to want to fit 
then there are a couple of things to look out for one is the uh, proper uh, ratchet wheel screw the other is the uh, cam jumper spring and the third is that little detent that goes through the movement to help with the hour count to reset by the way one thing that can be very useful when working with uh, chronograph movements is to leave the screws in place that way you won't mix them up for this movement that's less of an issue since we have a very clear technical communication available so we started putting together the chronograph parts right here we're doing the oscillating pinion And this uh, friction spring here with that little uh, plastic donut on top it's probably the most pingable part ever made in the watch industry so be very careful when you uh, handle that one it fits underneath the uh, chronograph wheel then here we have the clutch and this is uh, probably the main difference between an oscillating pinion uh, type chronograph and a horizontal clutch type chronograph the bottom of the oscillating pinion is in constant mesh with the fourth wheel and when the clutch tilts the top over in a little bit it comes into contact with the chronograph wheel it's a pretty nifty way of doing it if not the most uh, elegant looking and it's quite efficient doesn't really steal a lot of amplitude from the movement and it's actually not a new invention it was invented almost a hundred years before the uh, 7750 was uh, first uh, made by the way what we're doing here is to grease the hard chip cams of the counter uh, wheels I'm going to counter and the chronograph wheel we're using uh, 9504 you can use uh, Molecule TX you could also uh, grease the uh, end of the hammer instead but I was uh, taught to do it this way so that's what I'm doing this uh, operating lever spring can also be a little bit tricky to get in it has two different ends and you need to make sure you put the proper end into uh, the proper place it's also a very functional uh, type uh, design and then we can put the operating lever in put a little bit of oil on the operating lever spring also just a tiny little blob of uh, D5 So I have a window in my workshop looking out over the Jura mountains in uh, Switzerland and sometimes it's sunny actually relatively often it's a nice uh, climate here but that's what creating a little bit of uh, shadows right now in the picture so when you're filming this you're kind of praying for the sun to go away Here's another psycho-esque uh, thing, plastic uh, components. This is the brake, or the lock as it's called in uh, this movement. There are versions of the 7750 with uh, metal components instead of plastic there. And here we have the hammer. And the hammer is uh, the piece that uh, hits the hard chip cams and then forces them to return to zero. It has highly polished ends to also reduce friction. And with all that in place, we can put on the automatic bridge.
can also be a very tricky to get in place. There's a little post at the end of it that fits down into the reduction wheel next to the reversal wheel. And since a lot of these components basically just float on top of the chronograph bridge, it's quite easy to uh, move things around when you try to fit that post in. But if at first you don't succeed, then try and try again. And again. And again. And again. Again. <sighs> Serenity now. You really do have to keep a Zen mindset when you're working on watches, because if you get frustrated by little parts pinging away or not fitting, have to redo things, then yeah, you probably aren't uh, going to be happy with watchmaking. We're getting the hammer spring into place. It's a very strong spring. It has this little eye towards the end of it, and it's very useful in uh, putting it back in place or for taking it out. And the last thing we're going to put in before uh, the chronograph part is uh, assembled is this uh, clutch spring. Can also be a little bit tricky. By the way, when you have a movement with a hack, it's quite uh, helpful to be able to uh, stop the movement whenever you're working close to the balance. Especially if you're putting in tiny screws or the like. Reduces the chance of damaging the hairspring. So we're checking to see that uh, the clutch works as it should. That the oscillating pinion engages and disengages properly. I'm going to let the chronograph run for a minute, just to double check that the uh, minute counter uh, flips over as it should. I'm going to speed this up a little bit, so we don't have to wait for a whole minute. And uh, obviously completely unrelated to that, if you've never tried uh, inhaling helium, as for instance from a balloon in a children's uh, birthday party, you really missed something. Alright, that looks good. And we can turn the movement over, start working on the calendar side. We mentioned uh, this when we took the watch apart. This is the actual uh, cannon pinion. It has to be very well oiled on this friction spring on the underside. And when I say oiled, obviously I mean greased with the Moleco TX or 9504. If it's not well uh, lubricated, then you risk a chance of uh, stripping some of the wheels when you turn the crown. One of these uh, dial fasteners was broken, so we replaced it. I tried using uh, duct tape on it, but just didn't work. This is uh, the weekday quick set uh, jumper, activated by the pusher in the case. A few of these springs uh, have different ends that look very similar. So absolutely worth uh, downloading the communication before you start working on these movements. The minute wheel has a little bit uh, different uh, construction than normal. The pinion is sort of a lantern pinion kind. So it's got a cover on top of it 
So the best way to put it in is together with the hour wheel, as I just did there. And the 24 hour wheel that you see we're putting in here is a reason for that little cover on the top of the minute the wheel pinion so that the 24 hour wheel doesn't uh, mesh and jam up the whole movement. Then we can put in the hour counter together with its uh, corresponding brake and hammer. The hammer goes on top of that detent that comes from the other side of the case and it's of course activated by the cam which is in turn activated by the operating lever. a little bit more 9504 on the contact points of this uh, steel parts and this uh, spring is also quite tricky absolutely to be uh, recommended that you hold the spring and the parts down and hurry 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 to put on the calendar plate calendar plate is secured with uh, three small screws. Two of those screws are uh, still exposed after all the components for the calendar works are in place. But one is uh, hidden under the month disc. And the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, because it might be necessary to take uh, the calendar plate off if you need to adjust the sequencing of the weekday and the date uh, jumping. Let's just first put the date wheel in place. There's a cutout and it's a calendar driving wheel next to it that you have to align to get the date wheel in place. Now that calendar driving wheel is uh, aptly named since it actually flips both the date wheel and the weekday disc. So if we zoom in we can see this little finger at the bottom here. That finger flips the weekday disc over. But at the underside of that wheel, we can see another pin. That pin goes through to the other side and flips the date wheel over. Now most of these kinds of wheel are friction fit, the two different parts. That goes for star wheels, for the date discs, weekday discs, that kind of thing. So if you ever need to adjust those things, you simply use your tweezers like I did there. Moving on, we're going to put in uh, the date corrector with its cover plate. When there is a moon face a disc in place, this one would also quick set the moon face. All the parts are actually in place, except for the moon face disc itself. That's the moon face corrector there. And there's the jumper for the moon face. But where's the moon face? Where did the moon face go? Yeah, I'm sorry. Not sure what that was. So after correcting the sequencing of the weekday and the date change, we uh, realigned the calendar driving wheel with the date wheel. And then we can put on the jumpers on the other side of the movement for the weekday disc. 
and while we uh, oil these uh, last few pieces I uh, mentioned without going into detail that Eberhardt is uh, viewed as a chronograph expert and you might then wonder why they use uh, stock movement like this one well the answer is that uh, they do like basically everyone else but this is not what they're famous for Eberhardt's uh, main claims to fame uh, lie in uh, a few different watch series like uh, the Extra 4 or Extra Fort. Uh, nowadays, especially the Chrono 4. The Chrono 4 is quite unique in that uh, all the different uh, counters and uh, the subdials are lined up four in a row. Mostly horizontal, but they also made the vertical uh, ones so that you can uh, more easily read uh, the timing of your chronograph and that is a module that they built uh, on top of the uh, ETA 2894 which is again built on top of uh, 2892 Eberhardt was the first to introduce an hour counter in a chronograph that was back in 1938 so already a while ago and they really competed with the likes of uh, Breitling and Longines in being first to uh, fly back chronographs and very uh, highly regarded in that uh, space. As mentioned, uh, today they are uh, probably best known for the Chrono 4, but in general I think the uh, different models that Eberhardt makes are really well designed very classic, very stylish, so worth uh, looking at. We've got all the calendar parts in place. We're going to start putting on the hands. On my chronograph like this one with an hour counter and the GMT hand, there are enough hands to choose from. So we need to plan a little bit. So as you can see, we're starting with a minute counter. And the reason is that uh, when the chronograph is reset to zero, it's going to point straight up towards midnight. And that's where a lot of the hands will uh, point. So we cannot press it down if we try to reset it to zero. The other hands will be in uh, the way. And next we're going to put on the hour counter hand. We started the chronograph uh, almost a minute ago already. So we're just going to check at the same time that the uh, minute counter goes back to zero. There you see it flipped to one. It goes nicely back. You can also see that we're using uh, Swiss play though to put the hands in place. The thing is uh, these uh, sunken uh, subdials the hands are very close to the dial so we really want to avoid as much as possible having uh, sharp metal objects close to the dial all right now for the date and the weekday we know there's a quick set for the date so if we change the date enough to uh, have the month disk flip over to the next month, then we know that's the first of the month. So we can place uh, the date hand correspondingly. For a chronograph, and especially one with a central uh, date hand like this, you will easily find that uh, the diameter of the collet is just too wide for your hand setting tools. So you might have to make your own ones with a little bit bigger diameter. For the hour and minute hands, it's a standard procedure. We first uh, forward uh, the hands or the time setting mode till the date flips at midnight. And then we put uh, the hands at midnight. 
the GMT hand also needs to be aligned of course. It's the same procedure. Find midnight, place the hand, test. The biggest issue in placing hands on a chronograph is the chronograph second hand. That's for a few reasons. Chief among them is that uh, if you mess up the alignment, you'll probably have to take all hands off again and uh, do a lot of extra work. Second is that uh, in some movements, and 7750 being one of them, the chronograph seconds hand can be very very tight so you might even have to uh, sort of stake it on or hammer it on especially when it's a new movement so that's also a very good reason to have this kind of movement holder where you have support for the other side of the pivot now the watch isn't running fast we just sped it up a little bit Just gonna see that everything works together. So in the meantime I actually put on a new crystal on the case. So here we see that uh, the movement has uh, been running the chronograph for half an hour. And then we try to reset and just make sure that the hands are well aligned. So with all that looking good we can uh, case the movement again. We polished the case a little bit, put on a new crystal as I mentioned. I'm going to put the actual crown and stem back in. You might remember that when I took the rotor off initially, I mentioned that uh, the screw for the rotor is a special one with this little dimple in the middle that actually supports the chronograph uh, seconds uh, hand. So we need to make sure we have that same screw here, otherwise we're going to break the pivot. For the ball bearing we're going to put some Lubetta V106. Make sure it runs smoothly. Of course, 7750 has this characteristic uh, wobbly for the rotor. It's an easy way to tell if a watch has a 7750 family movement. Just put the watch flat in your hand and raise your hand fast and take it down again just as fast. If you feel and maybe even hear the rotor spinning like you know it's a 7750. All right, with the case pack back on, I'm going to put on the nice uh, strap. Test things one last time. Can basically never do enough testing for a watch, especially complicated watches like this. And it looks quite uh, good on the wrist, I think. We'll let the chronograph run even a bit longer. A pretty handsome watch I think. Chronographs are typically a little bit bigger and perhaps more imposing on the wrist. We covered a lot of ground in this long video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for staying with us. If you like our videos then clicking like and subscribe will help us a lot. You'll also be notified when new videos uh, come. We'll be back shortly. Until then, 
Tata.